We went outside the cycle of nature. We don't understand how nature repeats itself once and again. In the Buddhist tradition, when they talk about Kala Chakra, the time wheel, the awakening, the enlightenment happens through the cycles. You harmonize yourself with the cycles and it happens naturally in its own good time. We got a mistaken idea of what Atlantis was. This civilization was not a civilization that developed towards the outside, but a civilization that developed within. If you appreciate that your civilization is going to fall, but you understand that you reincarnate, not just individually, but we reincarnate. This last 500 years has been a quickening where the empire force has spread over the world. But it feels like there's other forces that are at work, extra dimensional, extra planetary forces. If they reach this planet, it's because they understood how to travel through the fifth dimension. And if they travel through the fifth dimension, it's because they understand the system. Like for example, the gray ones. They are a civilization that for us in Earth, they are the bad guys. Okay, let me tell you a story, Matthias, okay. from our planet. <laughs> so there is a law. Don't interfere with planets that are evolving in consciousness. So aliens aren't going to save us. Oh, no, of course. <laughs>
I don't know, uh, jars or uh, golden things or, I don't know, um, things Artifacts. that... Artifacts. Uh, roads, things that would say, oh, this was a very expansive civilization like the Romans, for example. But they actually, they weren't like that. They were more connected with the land. They were more related to uh, tiny temples that were for the within, and they would create huge pyramids, but maybe there were tiny houses around or small villages with domes, but that's it. So most of the great civilization that we picture sometimes, uh, it was not civilization towards outside, to conquer. It was a civilization to understand. And that's why we, when we connect with that civilization, we, we usually uh, talk about the wisdom that they had. The last period of Atlantis was to conquer. The last period of Atlantis was... So that's I when need. it started to turn. Exactly. Because they knew they, their time was finishing. It was ending. So they started to get scared. How did they know? Cycles. They were connected. Stars, the planet. They understood in the same way as you have spring, uh, summer, autumn, winter. They knew that whatever blossoms in spring eventually will die in autumn. But for a civilization, it takes maybe 2,000 years. So they understood the cycles of everything. So they knew exactly in 2,400 years, our civilization will turn off for others to rise. So they, we need to get ready for that moment so we could transcend and not be forgotten. So I'm trying to understand. So then what was the motive for them to turn to conquest? Why did they think that conquest would be their salvation? Because there were many uh, different powers in the civilization. Like they didn't have a king or the major priest or something like that. They had many layers of governments and they started to disagree in how the power should be uh, kept going. Like the high priest, they said, well, we should die and be remembered in 12,000 years. The king said, with the families said, we need to bring this message to other cultures so they can remember us and we can create communities all over the world. So in case something happens to us, another one will remember through blood. And the military, they said, they don't want to do that. So we have to force them to do that. We have to force them. And so they started to use the technology of the pyramids as a way to control the others. And mm -hmm. they started to use the inner power for the outer power. And that's how the civilization entered in a conflict within itself. So the wise people left Atlantis and went to the Nile or to Mexico. Um, others just decided to get lost in the mountains, in the, in the Caucasian mountains or Tibet or um, in North America, some others in South America. So they all spread trying to leave the power of control of the last 500 years of that civilization. Mm -hmm. And usually that's the moment that most of the people remember as a trauma of that civilization. Like, oh yeah, they, they, Atlantis was a civilization that tried to control everyone and they were warriors and, and powerful and they wanted to conquer and they started a war with Lemuria. And this, this, this moment of the trauma was more heavier than the past 5,000 years of that civilization that actually was a civilization, a civilization that was designed to the within. As I said, that's why people don't usually find the daily life things because they knew that it was all essential. So they wouldn't keep anything. They would just restore everything to nature until the last period. And the only things that they actually built to be remembered were the huge structures 
that were used as a technology. Mm-hmm. So that was the most important things for them because, because in that in that way they would be remembered, not as not as a civilization. They would be born again, and they could use it again. So, hmm. it's because they had the, the the understanding of their reincarnation, the fact that they were going to keep coming back. Yeah, and so they started to plan for their future reincarnations for at least 24,000 years it's like now the presidents make a plan for four years we did a plan for 24,000 <laughs> <laughs> when matthias talks about this you know obviously you've been you know deeply enmeshed in of course your own tradition you know the buddhist tradition but also the ancient history of our civilization. So as he describes this, what does that evoke in, uh, from you, John? Yeah. Well, I'm sitting here and just reflecting on how we're at a similar moment in the cycle and the similar squabbling that's happening. Um, no doubt, um, you know, there's various various people in government who are aware of these cycles, but these cycles, our civilization has been so disconnected from sacred world. We're so separated that we're not aware of these cycles. So if you think of the effect of Christianity on the last 2000 years of separating ourselves from the sacred and putting the sacred elsewhere so that we, we're not we're not aware, we're not prepared, we're not ready. We don't know what time it is. And then, and then as far as I'm aware, those in government who are aware of what time it is, well, some of them are like, we're gonna just dig a hole, right? There's the, we're gonna dig a, there's the, we're gonna dig a hole in the ground mm-hmm. approach. Um, possibly but, under the Denver airport, yeah, possibly not. Possibly, but but uh, I mean, you see all those underground cities in Turkey, Yep. Right. I mean, they were built for, they were built for something, for something. <laughs> so the first thing I'm aware of is just the degree of poverty of our civilization, just in terms of just being so disconnected from the cycles of, or even of the, of the season, <laughs> let alone the cycles of the planet, let alone a 12,000 micro, you know, solar micronova cycle. We just, we just, we just so deeply disconnected mm-hmm. from the sacred in that in that way, um, and 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 then it the the next reflection is well, in order to fa- in, in order to understand the cosmology, it isn't just about these cosmological cycles. It's also about a deeper appreciation of 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 Gaia, of our planet, and of our reincarnatory process that is a part of our planet's evolutionary pulse. And if you appreciate that your civilization is going to fall, but you understand that you reincarnate, not just individually, but we we reincarnate. Mm. And that that is, it's it's not anthropocentric. That is a function of a larger organism that's pulsing and growing, which is the Ma herself, right? Mm -hmm. A a mother. Um, So I think the first thing what speaks is, well, how deeply like disorient, we are completely disoriented and not ready for any kind of cyclic transformation, even like spiritually, right? Like we just, like the fact that, that in order for something to be born, something has to die. I like, uh, and, and in order to live, you have to be okay with death. Mm. Like, so mm-hmm. the very fact that we've, avoid, uh, we've avoided this history, we've avoided the possibility that we will die as a collective means that we're not really, we're not, we don't live either, right? Mm. We're, we're kind of, we're numbed. So these are the things, these are the things that are coming up. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, thinking about the cycles and how that's the similarities and differences. 
1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You know, that's roughly 500 years ago. And that is not what actually marks empire because we had empire far before that. I think the Egyptians took some empirical, you know, the, the forces of empire and this desire to conquer and conquest that existed before in limited areas. But it really blossomed when that ship technology came and people could come and start colonizing the Americas mm -hmm. and colonizing mm -hmm. Australia and all of the different indigenous peoples who had lived in right relation with the land. So in some ways, there was an earlier appearance of empire in our story mm -hmm. of this 12,000 years. It happened earlier in some places, of course, you know, the Greco-Roman empires, the, mm -hmm. all the, the Persian empires, all the Egyptian empires, all of the empires. And then also there was a huge swaths of land that were basically untouched, potentially helped seeded also by Atlantean wisdom mm -hmm. that came and were able to live in connection where they could speak to the rocks and, mm -hmm. they could, and the trees and the wind and everything was sentient and alive. So it's similar in a way that this last 500 years has been a quickening where the empire force has spread over the world mm -hmm. and we're trying to control everything now mm -hmm. in this final, you know, we're going to die. We need to control everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then with that is an opportunity to, to do something different, mm -hmm. you know, and potentially change the way that this transition, some transition is going to happen, but feels like we have the opportunity to navigate how that transition happens. Yeah. The, um, we, we as, a, as, as humans, we started to, to expand and trying to control others uh, because our fear to death. We, we wanted to survive because we had no idea what would happen after. Uh, so... As, a, as any cell or as any organism, you are trying to eat as much as you can to stay the longest alive as you can. And when you feel that there's a threat, you better first, to be, before you get attacked, you have to attack in order to protect your survival. So this created the idea of expansion constantly and uh, the idea of empires trying to control others in order to survive for longer. And this disconnects us from the, the very truth, with, which was um, that actually expansion could be done from within. So some people, some of these first cultures, they started to wonder what would happen if instead of expanding outside, would be expanding within. And that expansion takes to the idea that we actually never die. And it was not something spiritual at the beginning. It was just by looking how a flower dies, but next year the tree will blossom again. So what if we do the same? What if when we die, we will blossom again? And we are just flowers in a tree, but we cannot see the branches. So the idea of dying and rebirth in nature as the plants were growing and flourishing and then dying and flourishing again, uh, started to create other civilizations that they didn't fear death. And when you don't fear death, you don't fear uh, survival. So you don't need to survive. So you stop conquering. So you stop fighting mm -hmm. for resources. So because you, you are not afraid of what is happening. Because it doesn't matter if you die, you will come back. In different ways um, to keep going, going. So what they tried to do was we have to understand the tree. So when we come back, we know where the branches are. So they started to expand through the world, not to conquer the world, but to know where the flowers are. And we call it portals. Mm -hmm. We call it the greed, the, the network. The and grid, yeah. The grid, yeah. So they started to find the mountains that were flowers, the, the valleys that were flowers, 
So we went to those places and we, we started to settle there with this idea of we are not going to die, but at least we know where we could blossom again. And they started to build the pyramids there so they could create bridges between dimensions. So when they die in another dimension in the skies, the precession of equinoxes will bring us back. You know, so they saw the tree of life and they started to design the tree of life. And um, that's, that's the greatest moment of that civilization. And it's something that we all have within. But as we were saying, as Mark was saying, um, we don't know today where is the North. Mm. Like most of the people don't know where is the North. Mm. And so that's why we lost the North. We don't know where we're going because until there was, an, until we created the compass, when we created the compass, we forgot where the North is because we forgot how to get in touch with the planet. So we started to create tools outside to make it easier for us, mm. but we stopped using our own tool. So we cannot feel the stones, not because the, the stones talk, but because they vibrate. They vibrate with the rhythm of the hertz of the planet. So when you feel the feeling of or the vibration of the stones, you say, oh, they are talking. Or because you're feeling connected to that. Or just by being like, you know, seeing where the, the birds are flying, you will know where the north is. And these kind of things, like not knowing when to go to sleep, when to wake up, the first cycle, which is a day, and then not knowing what an equinox is or what a solstice is, uh, that disconnects us completely from this subtle perception of, of eternity. Mm -hmm. So we are constantly thinking, okay, I have to go to sleep because tomorrow I have to do stuff. But no, it's an important moment to go to sleep because it's you die. You, you, every time that you go to sleep, you are dying. And... Every time that you breathe, you are dying. Mm. Your cells are dying. So that is the thing that we lost. That connectivity of eternity, of constantly being dying and constantly rebirthing. And that's why we, instead of breathing, we try to survive like, mm. you know? Yeah. So yeah. you have to breathe Gasping. because... I have to take all the oxygen, all the, all the food, all, all the things that I need in order to survive instead of just knowing I will die anyway. Yeah. And, and it, <laughs> it seems that there's, there's also the disconnection from the natural order and these beliefs in reincarnation and all of the things that we're talking about, mm -hmm. they fuel the forces of empire for more conquest, right? Like they work together. Because the less you are connected and the less you believe in reincarnation, it's like the more justification you have for your conquest. Mm -hmm. And so they, they work together in this kind of nefarious pact in, in a way like they're just uh, allies. Well, the great, for, the great forgetting, there's a forgetting in the past and then there's, then there's also the interdimensional forgetting. Mm. And there must be a relationship between those two processes, right? That that we've lost we've lost a in in those times we understood that the center of civilization wasn't actually in matter, it was actually in the subtle. And that um, sacred world, you know, the subtle is still matter, right? So it's not like it's not that it's just a little less little less coarse. Mm. But if you think of Everything that we're doing in, our, in Western civilization, uh, what the Rosicrucians called the invisible college, right? We, we, we could have sacred chemistry, physics, architecture, medicine. If we look at the degree of how evolved our civilization is and then say, well, what would it take to bring it up to speed? I think it's important for us to feel and know that that already exists. Uh -huh. Meaning, where we've come from, the 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 flat like we are a flower into time and matter from a deeper center, a, deep, a deeper center of civilization and culture, 
When we talk about secret, a sacred world, you know, the ancestral realms, this is real. It's real. It's not just a messy kind of flowing yeah. that, that actually the cosmos has, has an anatomy and a physiology. Our planet has an anatomy and a physiology and the civilizations are part of that process. And that there is a, a harvesting process of what happens, what we learn in matter, but, but the, so much of it actually happens in the subtle. Mm-hmm. And that isn't to negate the, the beauty of, of this kind of, of realm, but it's really important for us to remember the, the cosmology that we lived in. It's, it's the losing of that cosmology. Because if you lose that cosmology, then you, then you lose the, even the idea that there's some, that there's somewhere to connect to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have, I have students who are scientists and, um, at night they, when they're in the lucid dream state, they go to a classroom and they're learning about these, these new technologies. Now that happens in another civilizational state. It's, it's subtle. So that the, the loss of our connection to an understanding of continuity of civilization being not just, not just on the physical, but in other dimensions. We've, once we lose that, then we are, and we even lose that understanding spiritually, because then you can still have a sense that you're on a path, but you, but you, 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 we lose the, the community and the civilization that we are actually a part of. Mm-hmm. That even though it isn't fully manifested here, all the work that we've done over these lifetimes, all the work our ancestors have done isn't lost, right? And, yeah. and then there's another cycle. Available, available for download. Available for go download. To your, go to your spiritual app store. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and it's that's right. Available yeah. for download all of the wisdom that's been captured. And, that's right. Um, it's like the seeds in the fruit, you know, in a tree, like... The, the seeds can be reproduced, reproduced, and they will keep all the wisdom of the, of the tree before. So we are constant seeds of this tree. So eventually we will grow and we will have the same information. So it's alive all the time. Yeah, it's like a, so there's two, there's two things that are coming, landing for me. One is the recognition of if I really just sit with that, you know, kind of timeless perspective of the reincarnation of self and civilization. It actually reorients the mission in this life because it's not just about me and my family. It is about me and my family, but it's also beyond me and my family because my family enlarges to the family of Gaia, the planet and all of civilization and how no matter what happens that we set up ourselves in the best way that we can for the future civilizations to come and do our best to ease the transition and salvage what we can here. But just feeling that I also recognize that I haven't, even though I know that to be true, I haven't allowed it to fully seep into my bones Mm -hmm. and really, really get it. So, you know, that's, that's one thing I just wanted to reflect as moving through me. And I also want to go back to this idea of, because I think it was a, you know, not true, but partial explanation for the desire for conquest and the desire for empire, right? Like so based on fear, based on scarcity, based on that. But it feels like there's other forces that are at work in this beyond just survival and beyond just these even extra dimensional, extra planetary forces that are actually looking to undermine life itself, looking to control squash, dehumanize, degrade life with a capital L Mm -hmm. itself. And it seems like these forces have been very active and are very active now. I'm just curious from your perspective, Matthias, to talk about these forces from a cosmological standpoint and then potentially other stories that you've heard of other star systems that decided to go one way or another way Mm -hmm. and how these forces have kind of influenced in a history that even extends further back than our own history. We're talking about this galaxy or Lucifer? Well, (laughs) both. Why not? (laughs) Why not? Yeah. (laughs) 
Mm. When, if we talk about the origin of uh, the forces that makes everything to collapse and to um, corrode in existence. Turn upside down. Yeah. Um, the, the first one that did that, the first uh, creation that did that was division. And we have talked about this, how the universe, in order to fall in love, with itself needed to split into like humanizing the idea of romanticizing the idea of a particle divided in the wave. So when the wave choose to divide itself in two different particles, we divided the universe, but in that split, a spark of light was created. And that's, that's what we call the bearer of light, which is Lucus Ferus which is Lucifer. So it means that from the trauma of division, light arose, but it was a trauma. So the very moment of enlightenment in the universe, when one thing divided in two, it created the most beautiful thing, but at the same moment, it created the first trauma. So the system of following the light it's a system that constantly divides, and which is the paradox we talked once. Mm -hmm. um, the paradox of as closer you get to the light, more likely you will burn. And it's because the system, in order to create options to be manifested, to be uh, to feel life, you need to divide many more options. So there is a system in the universe, which is the system of light, that is constantly dividing something. So every time there is a spark, there's something that has to be divided. So when we leave that trauma, boom, I see clarity. Oh, I understood. So there is one side of the universe that is forcing us constantly to divide. As the universe the main goal of the universe was let's divide in order to understand the link. Because when everything is one, you cannot feel the link. So you need division in order to understand the connection. So there's one side of the universe that says, I feel the other. And there's another side of the universe that says, for you to feel it, I need to create the other, the opposite. So... As we get closer to the light, there is one system that says, it means that I have to divide you more. Mm -hmm. So we call that evil, but actually it's a system of division in order for you to find light. Mm -hmm. So evil and good are just perception of human morality, of something that in the universe is very natural, which is a wave divided into two particles. And these two particles are constantly divided into other two, another two, another two, and it creates many thousands of billions of options that creates confusion. And that's what we uh, understand as the, the source of evil or the source of uh, separation, the source of conflict, polarity, duality as something that pulls us apart from the sense of unity. But even though it was the trauma that created the path towards unity, towards understanding of why we need unity. So it's this paradox of we need each other in order to find unity, because we wouldn't be talking about this if there is no conflict in the world. Like, why to explain this if everyone is living in peace and harmony? No, no, we wouldn't be in this quest of trying to understand better why we are here. Mm. So um, for other worlds, it's different because they are not mammals, for example. So they don't have this relationship with mom and dad. 
So they don't have this relationship. Also, for example, in, in Sirius, there are some planets that uh, they only have two hours of night, let's say two hours. There are two suns. So usually you have two sunrise, two sunsets, very short. So it means that they evolve in a way that they don't need much to sleep. So they are all the time awakened. So this means that as more stars are closer to you, um, less confusion. So they didn't need to go through the process of the trauma of separation of mom and dad, the moon and the sun, the night and the light. Uh, it was not biological design like that because the structure of their solar system was different. So um, for every planet, it's completely different, the path of what is evil and what is good. Um, but everyone understands when we, are, we, when we reach a point of consciousness, we all understand that every separation is part of the creation. Every unity is part of the purpose. So that's why the aware civilizations in other realities, they don't interfere with our evolution because they understand that planet Earth, and not humanity, planet Earth, we are part of the planet. Planet Earth is in a path of evolution according to having one sun and one moon. Having 12 hours of night, 12 of day, let's say. Mm. Uh, with a cycle of 24,000 years because of the precision of the equinoxes. So they cannot force a planet that is learning what is duality because that would be what happened here with uh, Cristóbal Colón. Mm -hmm. How is it in English? Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus. Um, coming here and saying to everyone, Jesus is the word. Like maybe in the Mediterranean Sea, but here we had ayahuasca. <laughs> and peyote, you know, that was better than Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but, um, but they said, no, this is better. So they imposed the truth. So aliens wouldn't do that because if they reached this planet, it's because they understood how to travel through the fifth dimension. And if they travel through the fifth dimension, it's because they understand the system. So, so they, they wouldn't come and force us to follow the light because it's not. So aliens aren't going to save us. Oh, no. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I guess, I guess then it's, it's very, it's almost impossible to see out of the prism of, you know, I had a, speaking of ayahuasca, I had a very deep ayahuasca journey where I understood that the God that I call God, which is good, mm -hmm. God and good. Yeah. And it is our God, actually, in a way, as if our, our planet's God, and that there was actually other conceptions of God that could exist, and those gods could have different ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to think about, you know, I just recently rewatched the movie Dune. You ever see the movie Dune, yeah. Matthias? It seems pretty clear from our God's perspective, goodness perspective, there's the Fremen and then there's the Harkonnens, right? Fremen, good. Mm. Harkonnens, <laughs> fuck that. <laughs> like want no fucking parts of yeah. that, you know? And then there's the other civilizations that are somewhere, somewhere in between trying to find the, trying to find the balance where the protagonist of the story comes from. I forget what that civilization is called, but Ultimately, like, I guess it would be fair to say that in the Hark from the Harkonnen system, in the Harkonnen's God system of what is good, maybe they're killing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Like, like maybe they're killing it or something. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, it, I mean, but then, then as they interfere, the problem is when they interfere with a world like the Fremen's, that's what's fucked up. That's the collapse. That's what's fucked up because they're imposing their mm. good and bad onto a place where their imposition is clearly bad. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, when you start to cross, cross those ideas, but it's difficult. It's difficult. It's such a stretch to imagine, imagine diff different conceptions. I want to extend the good out universally. Right. So the question you had around 
extending good and evil out, right? I mean, if you think of, from one perspective, evil is what happens when trauma, when the, when the cycle of trauma keeps going and it's not processed. And rather than opening and releasing and feeling, there's a process of contraction more, 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 more contraction. And then it gets to a point where it's so contracted that no longer wants to feel the pain and projects it out and then attacks what's there. Mm. So you have, you can think of evil as complete contraction, right? And, and of course, which is in the Buddhist tradition, this is the wheel going one way and you have the wheel going the other. So you can look at it in terms of splitting which is one way of, or you can look at it in terms of what direction is the wheel going, hmm. right? And you can, you can have, you can evolve civilization with the wheel going the wrong way. I mean, we saw with the Nazis, right? We saw like, oh, that wheel could just, and if that wheel had kept going and kept going and kept going, you could, you could have levels of, of evil that are, that, 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 yeah, and clearly that I mean that's in our God and goodness, right? So like there is in it's not that we're creating a moral relativism in our own in our own world. Mm -hmm. There is Nazis are not the same as the Yawanawa brothers who we just got to mm -hmm. meet and witness. Not the same. No, not the same. No, sorry, not the same. They're that's not right. morally equivalent. That's right. They're different, yeah. and so. There's but then, and then it's just opening up then the, the way in which we extend this out through the cosmos. Which the same kind of cycles. So we were referring to a cycle here related to a planet, but there, are, there would obviously be even larger cycles where the same process that we're talking about, drama and a narrative of, of, of Earth and Atlantis happens on one large, an even larger scale mm. where it isn't just planets reincarnating its stellar systems, right? It gets a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Same process repeating itself as, as the galactic organism, just like a planet is an organism mm -hmm. and, and has a karma, so, so does a galaxy. So that process can, we, we probably would see it throughout the cosmos. Right, so then if we go from that galactic federation kind of perspective, it still seems as though there's certain things that are of the good and certain mm. things that are of the not good, even, even from a, a larger perspective, even if you do have different stars and suns and, you know, I would, would seem different so. things. It would seem, seem like that to me. But in the confederation, if we call it like that, um, it's not an organization against evil. It's neutral. So I remember being there. I was not a very big politician there. It was just in... So you're talking about the Galactic Federation in a way, yeah, if you remember. Galactic that. Federation, yeah. Uh, I, was, I was just the secretary of a neighborhood. Um, in, like, if they had a problem with the sewer. <laughs> I was in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> like, nothing important. But <laughs> You're dealing with some shit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um but I but we all have kind of a like a public knowledge of what was happening. Um we were all connected somehow uh to know what was going on, even if we were not part of the government or something like that. So um, we, I remember moments of, like for example, the gray ones, the gray people, mm -hmm. we call it Xia Amur. The, the Xia Amur, they were, they are a civilization that for us in earth, they are the bad guys, you know, the mm -hmm. not good, <laughs> not good at all. But they had, a chair there. They, they wear, they exchange, because for their world, for their planet and their system, their, their solar system, let's say, uh, they accomplished to understand how that planet worked. 
Mm. So they accomplished a level of awareness mm. that represented the evolution of that planet. So they weren't trying to control anybody. Their, their nature was to turn off the light of the planet. Like they needed the resources till the core of the planet. So um, basically that was their nature. That was like the planets were their food. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, but they accomplished a perfect yeah, fuck harmony. Those guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fuck those guys. But what what yeah. you're saying is, is that their, their evolutionary path was not so much around ours, which is maybe love and wisdom, but exactly. more around. So in my tradition, we talk about how different planets have different lo logoses. Yeah. And these logoses have different evolutionary um, typologies. So there's some logoses that, that evolve through power. Yeah. And the personality of the planet itself. So you would imagine you could have a planet that raises a totalitarian civilization. Mm -hmm. In our mind, that's bad. But... For the psychology of that planetary system, that, that is it. Yeah. And it's complete order. Now, our, our logos... And in some ways, that balanced with polarity with our... Well, well this know, is, I think erotic, this is the... Erotic planet. Exactly. Our, our planet isn't... She is... She's not... She is more on the love wisdom... Is a mother. Our planet is a mother. Yeah. Yes. And wildly their planet erotic. Was wildly not. erotic. Exactly. Their planet was not. Yeah. And uh, for example, there's, no, there's I, no big dick slinging gray the, aliens. The conversation that I remember, for example, was they, they were they were saying in the conversation that they had was um, the decision of bringing some humans to be part of the meeting. And these people said, no way. And the reason was because humans feel so much that would hurt the magnetical feel of their bodies and they would die of a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> if they caught, if they caught a little piece of, yeah. piece of yeah. my so, Jewish anxiety, it yeah. would just, so, it would just okay. burst into flames. So imagine, imagine, imagine you as a Pisces going to a grave saying, I love you, brother. <laughs> you know, so who is the evil one? <laughs> so, so really this is about creative friction, right? Yeah. It's like good versus evil. At least in this, it's it's polarity, different typologies, different evolutionary, e different evolutionary functions, like different that that when they rub against one another. I mean, mm. clearly we might not. Uh, our planet seems to me has a. It's a lot about free will. And, and and there's a lot of freedom, and we value we value that. There might be systems where that isn't the case. Yeah. And we, I think, I, I think we would see that as being evil. Mm -hmm. But if you're a mantis being, or if you're, right, I, I mean, if, if if it's a different line of evolution, we have to be able to step outside and just appreciate. And that, and that is, I mean, the best of us, the best of us, our planet could create the the Christic impulse, mm -hmm. you know, which very well may have been carried by the one named Yeshua, but it's it's a real thing, regardless of your history. Quite likely, Yeshua did carry that Christic spark of non-judgment mm -hmm. so that he could actually see the greys or see the others and actually sit at the seat. So if they were going to bring one up there, he could sit at the seat and represent from that radical place of non-judgment. Mm -hmm. But it's that's uh, that's perhaps the aspirational impulse of how we could earn a seat at the at the table is we'd have to step beyond our judgments you know to a place where we could actually hold the balance of all the cosmos and that, that's what we were trying to do in the atlantan times when there were not only one ruler it was around the table we talked previously that it was around the table of different powers that they were all together deciding. So from inside, accepting each one of the levels of this humanity. And that's why they created, they created the idea of politism. So each one could follow their own truth. And even though they were all together in the Olympus. So even the bad guys and the good guys, they would hang, hang out together because at the end of everything, 
they are just part of the same circle, the same sphere. It's something that we are trying to practice with the UN, in a way, <laughs> trying, uh, in which all the different voices could be heard, and we are trying to bring balance in between all these voices. The thing is that the people that represents today, they are disconnected from the North Pole. Mm. <laughs> they are disconnected from the seasons. They are disconnected from Mother. So, um, so that's why this planet is not evolving. It's just practicing stuff. So, what about in this in this galactic federation? If there's a an ideology, a type of people, a race that is trying to intentionally impose their own way on a people that don't want that way mm -hmm. and potentially even deriving pleasure. Like a lot of the evil is when you derive a certain sense of pleasure from the hurt of somebody else, right? It's not just about the necessity. Maybe you need to eat a planet to survive. Well, that's one type of thing. Yep. But then if you're actually enjoying torturing the people that are there and the beings that are there, like you enjoy the torture, you, you're actually doing that. Is there like a, is there like a unilateral code of ethics? Like, no, like that's not cool. You can't come from this planet and fuck with these people and torture and hurt and kill them. Does that violates, that violates an international intergalactic, I should say, yeah. kind of eth ethos. Yeah. There are parts of that. There it is like that. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so think about so it. There, we we yeah. are like ants for them. <laughs> <laughs> so there. So if the be if the dark beings weren't policed by another, you know, ethos, mm -hmm. they would have already eaten us. Basically, fuck with us. Uh, they, us. They, they, they even wouldn't bother to talk to us because they just would eat the planet. But Let's think about this. There are billions of planets and, and most of the planets that are evolving, they are not in the level of evolution of their planets or our planet. Like there are billions of planets that they just have by bacteria or they're, yeah, they are just unicellular creatures trying to evolve. And those planets has also a nucleus, a core. So there are many planets to be eaten by them that they don't need to kill us. You know, so it's like... So it would be unnecessary and sadistic to kill us. And so... It's the, so full of planets. So yeah. full that Earth is just in a corner. It's not even important in our galaxy. Earth is like in the... It's like you have a garden and there's one little plant around there in between the whole forest. And you say, yeah, sometimes that plant has beautiful flowers. But it's, it's like, if, imagine if everyone, all the people that are here are just concerned about what is happening with that little plant there. Like, maybe some bees go, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So um, our planet, we, we, we perceive that the planet Earth is so important because we are planet Earth. Yeah. So, of course, we take care of, our, of our, who we are. But when you take a look into the universe, planet Earth is just a spark tiny little rock that is evolving. So there are billions and billions of planets that just have bacteria that are useful for the source of energy that they need. So there is a law, for example, saying, don't interfere with planets that are evolving in consciousness. Mm -hmm. So when a planet starts to think and say, I am, so don't bother that planet. And of course, there are people that could come and try to convince us like, our way is the best way, you know, these kind of things, because we are still trying to figure out what we want to do. But um, they cannot interfere directly mm -hmm. because uh, there is this law of resonance that makes that this planet is connected to the path of evolution of certain planets that are also mothers. Mm -hmm. So it's like mother cells. You cannot kill a mother cell because otherwise, if you need to reproduce the same pattern, you cannot have the mother cell. So the earth is like a mother cell in your body. You just can come here, put some stuff here and say, 
in case my planet dies before I was able to do something, I can come back here, take some human, take it back to another planet, bring the DNA and reproduce it again. You know, so this is like Noah's Ark, mm. like a mother cell in a huge body, which is the galaxy. So nobody would kill us. Just us. Right. <laughs> no, Just nobody us. would. Yeah, because um, they need us alive. Mm -hmm. we we're are creating the <laughs> diversity, complexity, the oh, yeah. possibility of the whole of the whole universe. We have so many choices. Like humans, this planet, not humans, this planet creates so many choices. Like others, there are many other planets with many choices. So it's like, oh, I want to put my seed there just in case eventually I will need it. Mm -hmm. So we are not controlled, we are monitorized. Like a farmer tries to take care of the crop. Mm. So is your decision to feel that the farmer is a bad guy or if it's the good guy that is taking care of you or are there are there both is this are there bad farmers who actually want to just wipe out possibility and complexity for some darker origin or to harvest some energy from us or do something and then are there the good farmers that want to see how our consciousness develops and see what if we talk about harvesting emotion is very good energy to harvest. So of course, as more unaware you are, more energy you create that you are not aware of. So you don't know how to handle your energy so someone else can eat it. So for sure there are some beings in other dimensions that they try for you not to be aware so they can use your energy. So let's say the bad farmers. Vampire. Vampire yeah. farmers. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. But as I said, um, before this podcast, we were eating. So for someone in nature in this planet, we also are the bad farmers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. life has to keep going. Mm -hmm. Energy exchange. Yeah. But interplanetary. <laughs> and... Right. I think that, and so when you become aware as a planet, that cannot happen. So the planet itself is protecting the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, that's why some people don't want for us to become aware, mm -hmm. but they cannot kill us because otherwise they cannot have mother cells. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, the, uh, the aligning with the unfolding of the planet itself, it's, it's intelligence. Yeah. Like our, our awakening, it's not our awakening, it's awakening to, to planetary intelligence. Yeah. And that what, as that happens, then something else happens because it's a much deeper degree of integration. Oh, yeah. Right. So you that start I, to listen to Yes. So, so that this, this, our awakening process is essentially about becoming becoming the planet when that happens there's a, a a much deeper level of cohesion coherence and protect the and integration mm -hmm. right because it's a it's a now it's a it's the planet as a conscious integrated entity be continue its continue its 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 evolutionary is journey. there is there a story matthias of another planet or a that has gone as far into what Charles Eisenstein would call the myth of separation. You know, he, he told a story in his book, A More Beautiful World, Our Hearts Know as Possible. And he talks about, you know, in his fictional story, there's never been a planet that's gone this deep into separation and made its way back, you know, just hypothetically, right? Like, like we've gone really far. We've been so disconnected from the planetary consciousness mm. that John mm. is talking about. Like, is there, is there, are there stories of other, other, maybe it's in our own planet or maybe it's in other planets of, of planets losing, losing their bearings to the degree that we've lost our bearings with the interconnectedness of the planet? Well, at least many of us. Yeah. And then finding their way back home. 
Yeah, of course. Of course. There are, there are planets that even died like forever and they need to go to other planets like the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki didn't came here because they wanted to go and queer. They came here because they had nowhere to go. They, their planet died because they were so lost. So Mother Earth received them and said, this will be your home. So that's why they were able to leave for a period of time here. Because um, if the planet don't want you, it will do everything to kill you. And they survived. So that means that Mother Earth allowed them to be here with love. Because she understood that they just didn't know what to do. Mm. And our planet is um, unconditional. Come here, lost children of the exactly. cosmos. Mm. Like, I'll show you some motherly love. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. maybe you'll find your way again. Mm. So they found love and they fucked everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the so these i mean the the forgetting could go all the way to existential destruction complete complete existential destruction of the whole planet you could forget so much that you kill everything or you could just depends on how quickly we, we remember so yeah. this process is about like how fast can we remember can we remember before we have before we forget so deeply that there's, you know, even greater and greater and greater calamity that we have to face. So it, it seems like that's really our directive here is like, mm. how quickly and deeply can we remember who we really are? Mm -hmm. Faster, you mean? Yeah, like, isn't that, wouldn't that be the impulse is like, what are we, what are we, what are we working for, striving for, fighting for? We're, fighting for a remembering that takes place quick enough yeah. that it avoids existential calamity. You know, right? Like, I think let's compare it with something simple in this case. Like if you would have a child, what would you do to teach him? Like, would you force him to follow the right path or would you give them the free, the freedom to choose and to learn from their mistakes. Like you would say to them, this is the right path. You have to honor this God. You have to be good in this way. Or you would say, this is how I lived and discover your own way. Like, how would you raise a child? And yeah, but if you had a child who is playing with fire, it would and, they were, and they were trying to light your house on fire. <laughs> yeah. You'd probably go like, yo, 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 yo. You have to put limits. Wait, wait, yeah. Yeah, you have to put like, limits. Whoa. But if you live in this house. But if you forbid him from use the fire, he will burn the house. Uh -huh. so, uh, so what would you say? Like, this is not the right place to use the fire, but we can go there and burn these things. Yeah. And... Try here, you know, so because the need of learning and when you're learning, you don't know what is the outcome. So there are beings that follow rules and beings that try to find a different way. So um, usually our mind is trying to find different ways. So if you forbid this, your mind will try to find a way to do it anyway. So that's why the learning process of a, of a child is to create the environment for them to practice without hurting others. Yeah, we're hella creative. It's like Mormons and they're soaking. You know about Mormons and soaking? No. <laughs> okay, let me tell you a story, Matthias, okay. from our planet. From our, from our great <laughs> from planet. From our planet. Yeah. So, <laughs> in, and I've heard this from, you know, from a, a Mormon friend of mine. You told me the story, just crack it up. So basically, you know, premarital sex is forbidden. Uh -huh. And the act of intercourse is forbidden. Mm -hmm. So what they've devised to get around the forbidden law is what's called soaking. And soaking is where you penetrate 
but you don't thrust back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. But if you got a good friend who's with you, the friend can jump on the bed. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so it creates the motion so that you're not actually doing it. So you're not doing the forbidden. You're not <laughs> fucking. The bed is doing the fucking for you. You just happen. You're soaking, it not be fucking. A good friend. <laughs> yeah. a good friend. Good friend. You want your heaviest <laughs> friend. <laughs> you, got, you, you got your thick boy Mormon soaking assistant yeah. who's just good at just bouncing on the bed in just the right way. You see, you find a way. You yeah. find a way. Oh, you will yeah. always find a way. No. So oh. that, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> you create always the environment for that. So <laughs> go back to what you were saying. <laughs> oh, brain. Let's just redirect this one. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that the, the other way to, to think about this is that um, clearly, um, clearly the, the world desperately needs to awaken. And yet, if one moves in that process to help awaken people from a place of existential anxiety where you're still looking for your survival in that process, then actually it's going to just, mm-hmm. right? The, the, on, the only elegant way is to essentially live in that world that our hearts know is possible right now like, like really right now. And then. Yeah. Be the right? living invitation. And then to the other way. Right. So that, so that then however people, because in the long run, in, the, in all of these cycles that actually in the long run is probably what make is what allows for real growth. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hello, Cyrano. <laughs> You're now the fourth guest on the podcast. There yeah. you go, buddy. It's it's one thing to for all of us to feel like to feel that the sense of urgency and, and existential um, the meta crisis that we have, right? And, and how it wants us. It's like when things want to go faster, slow down. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I hear. It's like you want to go faster, we slow down because the only the only possible way of allowing that culture to arise to whatever degree it can is from that it's from that place yeah that we right well otherwise you we just get whipped up into the the speed of of empire that, right? that's what i was trying to say with the with the child like you can force someone that has five years old to do something that someone with 50 years old would do you know like just because you know with 50 years old that that's not right or that's not good. Um, There's a process of many years in between that needs a lot of practice to become that. And as humanity, as as Homo sapiens sapiens, we have been in this planet for 3 million years. Compared to the history of the planet, it's nothing. So we are, we have gone too fast in a process that actually takes more time, like mm. millions of years until you become actually a planet. Imagine the dinosaurs have been billions of min- millions of years uh, and they were just practicing something or becoming the earth, but no with awareness, just with unconscious. So then with consciousness, everything speed up. So that's why mammals started to become so aware and it was faster and faster and faster. But the process of evolution takes a long time. It's not something that we will experience in just this life. It's cycles of and, cycles. And the, the impulse to create external technology versus internal technology has put us in a place where technology externally has outpaced our inner technology. So much so. And yeah. that's why so we're so. in a fucking tight spot it's, it's exactly yeah. if you think of if we were to bring up our internal tech to the level of the degree our outer tech is like like i don't know like that's like that's so much ground 
that needs to be covered. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, so much ground. It's it's a it's a huge gap. Yeah. And we, yeah. you know, we're starting with psychedelics, right? We're going right, like we're, we're beginning, but like, imagine that process. We lost psychedelics two thousand years ago. Yeah. So now we're beginning. <laughs> We've lost two thousand yeah. years in that particular and department. We did, and we did it as children. Yeah. Like in Egypt, when you were seven years old, here you are, mushrooms, blue lotus, <laughs> and, and blue lotus. lotus. So yeah. this was yeah. this was your this was your lifetime in in chem. Yeah. Right. So you were using the sacred plants and, you know, there were no antigens. teachers. They, the, the teachers gave you a tea. So you would do a ceremony with a tea. You would drink that tea. You start to see, and the teacher would start to ask you questions. So mm. it's the opposite. Just come out. Yeah. So. So you would learn through the questions. So the teacher would say, what is this? What is that? Mm. And you would start to see the answer. Mm. So it was the opposite. And then when the effect was gone, you discuss about the answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's been my education for the last 24 years. You know, I, had, I was educated all through high school, didn't know shit. <laughs> And then I went on... My first, I sat with my first real teacher mm -hmm. who was not a shaman, but a sitter, a sitter at the highest level. And the difference between a sitter and a shaman, shaman will actually influence the energies that are in the space, you know, kind of yeah. cultivate, create. A sitter is actually neutral and gave me a tea. Mm -hmm. And the tea was psilocybin, MDMA, mm -hmm. and gave me a tea and then allowed me to just find the answers, mm -hmm. you know, and that started me on my own quest of finding the knowledge internally. Yeah. And so that's, and that's also one of the technologies for this, these inner sciences, which have been shut down and cut off, mm -hmm. you know, and that's one of the things that could help accelerate our growth and learning is now we're able to not only harvest those technologies from our localized area, but through global trade and travel and, mm -hmm. and conversation, new possibilities of these medicines has, have emerged. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's the, you know, I've talked on this podcast before about the God bomb medicine that to my knowledge, maybe somebody else was doing it, but nobody was talking about it. And I'm pretty, got my ear to the ground, a combination of a certain, you know, series of ingredients that create a power and a way to actually be with somebody mm -hmm. as they move through that process to discover their own inner truths. And this was part of the mystery school kind of yep. concept that was all the way back, you know, mm -hmm. when we focused on inner sciences versus exterior sciences. Yeah. It was all about discovery. Like one of the, one of the hardest tasks that we had was uh, to live in darkness like in caves or hidden, so no light, um, to awaken the light within. So it was it was very tough. Some of part of the of the processes. Um, uh, there were initiations. There were initiations all the time, but we were children. Like um, they said, you had to experience all of this before you were 14. If you If after 14 cycles, you didn't do that, you would be um, linked to the perception of the outer reality. Mm -hmm. mm. So it would be very complicated for you to relate with yourself and you will relate all, all the things with the, other, with the others. So uh, that's why if you don't know yourself before you are 14 years old, you will only, only know yourself through others. That's so, mm. so that's why when you were 14, you were an adult. In that, in that civilization, with 15, you could be mother, you could be father, you could rule the country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, that's why the perception that we had is that we lived a lot. Because when you were 50 years old, it was like you were an elder, mm -hmm. like a very, very elder. You know, you knew so many things and you, 
you understood so many things. Now we are 30 something, 40, and we're starting the path. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, and that's. And what know, we should do is yeah. to heal the childhood, the traumas that our mm, parents did. Mm, right. So it's like we spend 40 years trying to heal traumas instead of. You know, becoming one with the, right. with God. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that's only it's only one of the technologies that was kind of shut down and clamped down. It was yeah. also our the technologies of sexuality. Yeah, the inner technologies of understanding our own eros, our own mm -hmm. erotic impulses, which I'm sure also had a much different trajectory. And what was it like? You know, how did people learn about sex? And how did people like where and how did that ultimately develop as well? Because there's a big reawakening, not only of the psychedelic renaissance, but also sacred sexuality in, yeah. in its way in magical sexuality, sex magic, mm -hmm. you know, starting to understand how to harness those energies in a powerful, in a powerful, magical, productive way. Yeah. Yeah. In that time, um, um, Sex was, uh, they said, there are many ways to understand it, but first is reproduction. And you, um, they said, you need to find the right person to create, to manifest and create reproduction. Then you need to find people that would complete your chakras, let's say. So um, mm. for, that, for that moment, we had one partner that was forever and it was not usually because of love. Like when I, when I met my husband in that life, for example, it was a priest that chose that we should be together because they understood the pattern that we had. Like you are from the clan of water, you are from the clan of earth. So you pour the water on the earth to create this and suddenly we were married. So, <laughs> so it was like, okay. But, um, uh, <laughs> the classic arranged marriage <laughs> sign. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Water, earth. Uh, so, um, but, um, we were practicing sexuality since, um, we developed like 12 years old, for example, like we needed to practice to have, the ability to connect with our own sexuality, with other sexualities, with um, reproductive sexuality. So uh, sex was a way to uh, restore the magnetical and energetical energy of our, of our um, own self. So some people choose the path of, uh, how do you say it in English? Celibate? Celibacy. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, in order to uh, to work mainly with the um, with the whole with, with the pattern of their own energy. They're called kundalini. Yeah, with the kundalini. So it would it would uh, be a whole life about that, and it was a choice. It was a, a choice, and uh, for others, for example, in in, in our clan, uh, we had many people. Like we were many people. What it do you was, mean? Huh? What do you mean? Like I, I was um, like, mm, we were in a community. Polyamorous, polyamorous. You mean like many, many sexual relationships? Yes. Yeah. Kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. So in, you order, had, in order to balance, there were priestesses and in, in order to balance the chakras, there were many, many relationships in order to bring to help support. Yeah. For example, in the temple of Den, uh, of Dendra, which it didn't exist at that time, but. The Temple of Dendera still teaches or was teaching about um, there were the priestess and priests that they taught how to use the Kundalini energy to others. So they usually said, okay, this person will live with you for four years or four months or like that to teach you this. And it was like, this person was specific for that task. And then you have to go to another person for the specific chakras mm -hmm. to awaken a specific type of energy. So I have, a, I have a question for you. But it was not love involved yeah. in that. It was only a process, energetical process. So, it's, so it sounds like that the, 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 this chem was 
organized as an educational civilization. Yeah. Is that where it was all about, was all about how it, to become all the about everything. It, all about education, right? <clears throat> all about lifelong learning. Yeah. And Actually, the, the, the people was called mm -hmm. Sut. Sut. Sut means, uh, means the path. And so the, uh, it was along the Nile. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. all the people they needed make, to walk the through journey. the Nile, yeah. make the journey. Mm -hmm. So we call ourselves the, the suit, path. The, the path. Yeah. So we needed to go through the path and we shouldn't be attached to any one of the steps of the path. So all dimensions, whether it was human sexuality or whether it was agriculture, whatever, everything was integrated in an educational journey. Yeah. Uh-huh. It was equally important to know how to cook, mm -hmm. how to sing, how to have sex. Mm -hmm. It was equally important for each one of the chakras to be balanced. Mm -hmm. And once you accomplish all that, that took around 33 years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, would, you were considered an elder. A citizen, like a citizen? Like a proper citizen. Proper citizen, yeah. What a, I mean... Weren't there still those impulses for just wild love that would just happen that was not oh, educational? Yeah, and, and so what was the place for that type of just like, I fucking love you. And I got this husband over here from Earth Clan and <laughs> but like, fuck, we're in love. Like, like what, what, what was the place? Like what, what place did that type of love have in, in chem? I don't know for the... I don't remember exactly for the lower society. We were divided in clans. In our clan, uh, which was Idilian, so we had to work with the elements. So we were divided in four clans mm -hmm. that were the families, representatives of the main four that came to the Nile. Osiris, Seth, uh, yeah, Isis and uh, Neftis. So we we represented that so we could only and only be related to the element that was complementary to us. Mm. We weren't allowed to be with others. Mm. But it was in that But don't you level say that every side. time something's forbidden, people do it anyways? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were humans. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, it would be uh, for for the other classes that were not part of these four families, it was much more open. And uh, also for the societies above us, which were like the kings and queens and stuff, they didn't care because they were not on the on the path of what we called the suit, the one that we had to... Um, it was like the difference between like the caste system with the Brahmins and the yeah. warriors. The warriors not so matter, but the Brahmins have to stay with the Brahmins. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was something like that. Yeah. So in the not lower society, but those who were um, following different gods, like the the polytheist, the polytheist part of the society. So the ones that honor agriculture, the ones that honor the fisher, mm -hmm. uh, the fishes, the ones that so they didn't have that problem. So they used to have gatherings and orgies and uh, because they were exchanging all this. Mm -hmm. like did, they, you ever, did you ever sneak out of Water Clan and just go like, I'm going to check this orgy out. <laughs> this, there's a fucking orgy rave going on down, down over here in the, in, the French, in the French quarters over here. So this shit is we, fucking lit. We, we had, no, we, 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 we were supposed to be very responsible. <laughs> yeah, we were supposed to be. Were very you? Responsible. Were you? Were you? I, do you have any memories of? These I was. Moments? I was. You were. You were responsible. I was very responsible, but uh, we could do anything with the clan of water on Earth. Yeah. So that was crazy. <laughs> so you had your own. <laughs> so you had your own wild and crazy kind of. Yeah, of course, because it was natural. Now the trauma of sexualities is because. Mm. Because we had 2,000 years of three main religions that forbid us to fuck. Yeah. But before that, Roman Empire, the polytheism, um, all the other traditions that were polytheistic, they had no traumas with that. 
because nobody was telling you you have to keep yourself for someone or you have to, you know, it was different. Uh, now we have to deal with our personal traumas of our traditions and cultures and and many things that um, that are related to um, um, to this re religious thing of um, possession, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's something that um, uh, you cannot do this because God don't don't like it. You can. It, when we were polytheistic, every god wanted something different. So there were not like this idea of mm. of following only one rule. You had like thousands of rules. So yeah. you could take whatever you, you wanted. Um, that's why in those traditions, it was very common homosexuality. It was very common uh, orgies. Um, it was very natural. That the the whole thing was natural because it was it was a way of exchanging energy. Mm -hmm. It was not, uh, um, yeah. Even though they had sacred sexuality, so sacred sexuality was related to the creation. Mm -hmm. So it was I have I have to create myself in another level of consciousness. So I choose someone to bring me into that level of consciousness. There were no problems of connectivity with anyone, mm. but when you were trying to reach creation, yeah. you needed to have the person that matches with your chakras. So that's what they call, you have to be with this clan. You have to be mm. with that. that was the version of the sacred union for the sake of the, of the child, the progeny. Exactly. Yeah. New child being your own soul, being their own soul. Huh? The child being their own develop their own exactly. development. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So so that's that's what they call the sacred union. Because it was about the balance, the connection, and the creation. Um, but culturally, there was no uh repress on on sexuality, because sexuality was constant creation and exchange. Mm. But as I said, for some levels of society it was like no way. You shouldn't touch someone that is from fire. Mm -hmm. You can burn. You know, these kind of things. Right. Yeah. So, so when you've now, well, you've stepped into this life and this life has, you know, thousands of years of stories that were potentially seeded from this monotheistic, shame-ridden hmm. religious structure. Obviously, you've either chosen or were born to live a homosexual path. Right, like it's just your nature, yeah, and and then so that's already you know divergent from the, but also fully accepted. Thankfully, thank God, we're at this place at most places in the in the world. Mm -hmm. But as you interface with the with the stories, the stories of just being with one partner and that partner, and you guys possessing owning each other's erotic impulses and all of that. Has that just never really landed for you because of your memory of the way it used to be? Or what do you, what do you think about? Because these stories have momentum and these stories are now, you know, putting us in a situation where that story is starting to deteriorate. Divorce rates above 50%. Those who stay together, most of them unhappy. You can chart graphs of the eros between them, the erotic impulse and like Wednesday Martin's book, Untrue you know, kind of declining or falling off a cliff and then infidelity rates, yeah. extraordinarily high, you know. So all of these things are trying to support a story that may not actually be the best guiding story to go by. It's, um, we are, as I said, we are coming out from 2000 years of Pisces, which is the two fishes. So... You need the two in order to organize everything. Now we are going to Aquarius, which is network. So when people start to wake up, the need of being two disappear. Because that's why people, when they start to connect and realize about their own lives, um, they start to go or against their... All the traditions, 
or trying to um, live a different way. So you start to wake up. So you are not bounded by the culture that you previously have. Yeah. Uh, that's why people get divorced and people start to, to right now it's so fast the process that a person has that before it took 50 years for someone to realize something. And now in a weekend, you can just have a huge realization and in 15 at days change it <laughs> at Burning Man, maybe. So, um, so uh, things are happening so fast right now and our civilization is experiencing all the processes that before took thousands of years to learn in just a few weeks. Yeah. So that's why um, we are experiencing this uh, disconnection from the two and started to go to the net. And that's why a lot of people is, is like weaving this connection of people instead of just looking for that someone. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I think it's right now we are living the trauma of that because we don't know how to do it properly. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Yeah, I li look, I lived the trauma of that, you know, I decided like, I get it. I understand this from my own in inner exploration, mm -hmm. you know, it was 12 years of inner exploration, you no, know, 14 or something like that. 14 years of inner exploration. I was like, fuck, I get it. You know, this story, the stories, it's not the story. It's not the story that, that makes sense to me. So I was like, I'm going to be polyamorous. Yeah. And I was like, I got this. It makes perfect sense. You know, love should not be, Eros should not be possessed by one person. There's so many possibilities and so many things that can happen. And I went in there and I was just fucking roasted. I was There's just, still 2,000 years. Of, right. So even though your frontal cortex is Aquarian, Oh you, man, still what did I, did I, I got, <laughs> I was fucking, <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, jealous and, and, all that. And, and tormented and, and broken up inside and so much pain. And eventually, you know, like a initiation, like a nonstop sure. ceremony, I ultimately evolved through the crucible of breaking and opening, breaking and opening and got better at it and was able to understand it. But it was still like trying to step into that new story was tortuous. Yeah. You know, in the Nile, the first temple that you visit is the root chakra. And the last one is the crown chakra in the pyramids. So, but um, we tend to believe that these are like opposite. When actually one is ruling the other. So when you go to the root chakra, you learn about spirituality, when you go to the crown chakra, you learn about sexuality. And why is that? Because the hypothesis gland, which is called pituitary here, and um, the pituitary gland is the one that controls the genitals. And the genitals are the ones that calm the pituitary. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. So why? Because the spirit is asking to be manifested into the matter. So your higher self is trying to manifest and your genitals are trying to survive and calm, like stay still in order to produce. So they balance to each other. What happens? When we disconnect from the spirit, we let all the forces of the spirit just into our bowls. Which means that is <laughs> <laughs> <He's> like no. <laughs> Which means that we divided the process of the spirit mm. into need and purpose. Mm. So in the middle you have the solar plexus, which is the ego. So um, when we disconnected from the spirit in all these two thousand years of history, or five thousand years of history, let's say. Mm -hmm. What started to happen is that we were more controlled by our genitals than our spirit. So because they are so interconnected, we can confuse the purpose of it with the need of it because mm -hmm. we are not connected. Mm -hmm. So 
that's what creates the trauma. Because you have an idea of, oh, this is how it should be. But actually, what is ruling that need is your balls. So, so it's like, uh, because we were disconnected from the spirit, the spirit knows, oh yeah, everyone is love. Everything is connected. But you can feel that not having sex. Mm -hmm. Why you have the need of having sex? Because the body was disconnected from the actual spirit. So because we are not interconnected in this way, like we used to become like with the Kundalini and everything. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are pulled by the need. We all are because we have been, our bodies have been 2000 years or more disconnected from that. So we can confuse the sexuality with spirituality because we are disconnected and all the spirituality went to our balls. And now, now when we try, when we understand that sexuality is a way to the spirit, but we have been forbidden to have sex for 2,000 years, now we want just to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so the first two, 200 years of Aquarius will be a trauma of sexuality because we have to release all the spirituality that was stuck in our balls. And um, what's the equivalent for balls for a woman? Is the same. Pussy? No, it's the ovaries. The ovaries. So ovaries and uh, mm. eggs, they're eggs, it's the same. So just uh, our, our balls actually are a malformation of uh, ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so we, we are a mistake in evolution. <laughs> <laughs> a necessary mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but so... So this disconnection of the actual spiritual sexuality, which is bring the spirit into the matter, made us confuse sometimes that having sex is love because we were disconnected. And, but actually having sex is bringing the spirit into the matter. So that's why it was the sacred sexuality is what not, it was not about pleasure. It was Pleasure is the result of the connectivity of all the chakras together. So the spirit can be manifested. Mm -hmm. So in sexuality, you experience the same thing as with ayahuasca. When you do that. When you do it right. When you do it right. Otherwise, it's just need of expressing something. And uh, I think that that's why to teach sexuality again and to be again expanded to be connected with others in a free way, you have to go through the trauma that you have been mm. holding for 2000 years. Um, the belly bottom down is seen. So it's still there. So everything that happens from the belly bottom down, even if we like it, our body interpretates as sin, as a mm. conflict. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have jealousy, conflicts and, and trauma from that. So even if our head understands what is the, the pattern of it and we say, oh yeah, love is, is expansion, is everything. Every one of our cells and some patterns in our brain still don't get it because it's only in the need of expressing something that I was forbidden for so long. So it creates confusion mm. and trauma. So, yeah. That makes a lot of fucking sense. And so it takes time. It takes time. <laughs> it takes time. The, as we're wrapping up, it's been a, a long day. We're going deep into the night here. And uh, the, the last thing I want to touch on is, you know, I'm wearing this necklace now and I've described this necklace. It's about relationships that I have that are not sexual in, in, in nature, but they're deep, deep, close friendships and alliances and this is like a symbol of my inner circle of my like closest friends and, and my own tribe within a greater tribe. You know, there's many more people that are not represented on this necklace who I love very much. But what was the, what was the idea around you? Cause you probably had a much greater sense of community for your whole civilization, but were there, was there anything involving like, developing the relationships with your friends, your brothers, your sisters, 
you know, what was that psychotechnology, the inner technology, the fruition of that? How did that look like the deepest friendships that you had and how you cultivated those and, and the importance of those? Mm. Community. We, um, we interpreted that family was not the blood. So, um, so we lived in communities, not families. At least that's how all the ancient traditions used to do. Like, um, um, every, every woman was a mother, a sister, uh, every man was a brother. Um, so, I mean, you see that in Hawaii, you have the Ohana, everybody's auntie, everybody's yeah. uncle. You know, there's this idea that it's beyond just the blood, that mm -hmm. there's some other sacred bond Yeah, there. Yeah, I think that, that, um, that the idea of just the family was created because of the, of the, um, how do, uh, the king and feudalism uh, mm -hmm. tradition. And, and of the, the of hereditary the transfer of wealth yeah. and title. Exactly. And yeah. So they said we have to create a family separated from other families and stuff like that. And by separating clans, the process of empire leads to greater and greater separation. A clan is so much more potent than a, than a couple, than a, than a little family. Yeah. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. so much more power when you're a clan than if you're just a, an isolated family. Hmm. And as I said before, for, for us was, we were divided in, in elements and we only can cross with certain elements. I had, my sister was another element. But even though we were in certain moments together doing stuff specifically for uh, our lives, but um, but I had my family as the water and the water clan, and she had mm. she had her family as the air. So even if we were the same blood, our clans were more important that than the family we were born in. Uh, so, um, because that creates a connection through time and through, um, like, like, a, like a soul that holds each other beyond time, beyond space. Mm. Um, yeah. So we, uh, that's how we lived it. Yeah. In that way. Yeah. John, what, what would you like to, uh, what would you like to ask Matthias as we kind of bring this to a close? Anything that's sparked in your own mind or anything you'd like to offer hearing this really deep remembering of, of sacred world and sacred relationship? I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm curious about how, how do you suggest, yeah, as, we, as this cycle is repeating itself again, mm. how do you suggest that people prepare themselves? What, is, what does that mean? And what does that mean for that to, to happen again? And, and, and what does it mean for people to come into right relationship with where we are, despite the obvious gap that we mm -hmm. have between ourselves and, and, and how it was in previous times? Yeah. The, um, well, of course, that there is something uh, today that we are, it's a global thing that now we have to take care of the planet. It's a whole, it's the whole thing. Before it wasn't, this is now a, a global civilization. Exactly. exactly. Before it was a region. Uh, yeah. During the Atlantean time, it was, it was a whole. But after Atlantis, there was regions. Right. And we were protecting regions and connecting with regions. Now it's a whole again. Yeah. We are repeating the, the same cycle. pattern, right. the cycle of a worldwide civilization that connected everything through pyramids, mm -hmm. that we had the same cultures, similar languages. And now we all kind of speak kind of the same languages, mm. even if each one has their own. Um, so it starts to be global again. Yeah. We started to talk about the net again, yeah. about nodes. Um, so 
um, we started to recreate what Atlantis was, but in the mood of Aquarius, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and globally, we have this thing now of taking care of the planet, mm -hmm. which is, again, from the point of view of we human, humans have the task of save the, the world, you know, which is a old story that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this is the first step for people to engage with the planet and start to wonder how to take care of the planet. So that is the first step to become the planet. Mm -hmm. So um, what, I, yeah. what I suggest, what I would suggest is for people to start understanding the main subtle things, like why do we have 24 hours? Why there is a North Pole physical and one magnetical? Why um, the seasons change? Um, to understand why the moon is there, why we have 12 months. So there are so simple, such a simple things that you don't even study in school. Like when they, when you learn about that in school, it's not powerful. It's just like data, but it's not powerful. You don't, you don't feel it. You don't learn yeah. how to connect with that. And, and I think one of the most important things to understand is that uh, we are not trying to awaken this life because we have to accomplish something as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. This is in every day we have this practice that we are going to sleep, we wake up, we do stuff in the day, we go to sleep again. Mm -hmm. So this first cycle helps you understand that you have you can do stuff and there's a moment to relax mm -hmm. and you can. So, uh, when you die, it happens the same and the cycle is constant and understanding the cycles helps you to know that you are not, um, late, that you are not, mm -hmm. um, uh, failing anything mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter if you don't accomplish that in this life. Because <clears throat> when a branch cannot give a fruit in this cycle, maybe next summer it will. Mm -hmm. But maybe it needed to go inside and store energy for them to blossom again. So um, I would suggest to take the chance to look into nature because we, we went outside the cycle of nature. We don't understand how nature repeats itself once and again. We, we lost that connectivity on how humans also do the same. How civilizations arise and fall is the same as summer and fall. You know, it's, it's exactly the same mm -hmm. thing. So um, uh, religions also do the same. It's a process, go up, go down. A civilization, a country, a family, a relationship. So. It's all cycles, it's, it's constant like that. So as soon we can engage with that, we are not gonna get enlightened. We are gonna live in harmony. Yeah. So first thing to understand, don't do this to get enlightened mm -hmm. <laughs> or to finish something or to arrive to somewhere mm -hmm. because- There is no- There is no way to no. go. The earth is rounded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even if you're running a ride in a yeah. straight line, you yeah. arrive at the same place. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So that that kind of th that wisdom of of um, learning what it means to start harmonizing with cycles, mm -hmm. like the the you know in the Buddhist tradition, this is what they when they talk about Kala Chakra, the time wheel. The awakening, the enlightenment happens through the cycle, like through the cycles. You harmonize yourself with the cycles, and it happens naturally in its in its own good time. Yeah. But if you try and be somewhere else in some other time, yeah, rather than learning the lessons that we have to learn right now, yeah, totally. Yeah. The 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 uh, 
for me, when I started to remember when I was 12 years old, what my life 12,000 years ago, I was desperate because I was like, my gosh, like I need to do this and mm. this and this mm. right now in order to accomplish what I couldn't do in 12,000 years. Mm. And suddenly I said, 12,000 years. <laughs> like I have time, mm -hmm. you know? And I remember a very high priest who was kind of an alien. That, kind of an alien. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was, we, were, we wasn't supposed to look into their eyes. And, <laughs> and I did. And he, 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 said, um, he said, now because of you have seen my eyes, you will live with the burden with a bargain of knowing that you have to wait 12,000 years to do it. Mm. Mm. And, and I remember that time uh, when they said, I said, why so long? And said, there is a time for everything. Mm. We are not in a rush. We will see again. But you just have to do other things in the middle. So... <laughs> he was he was so calm Ugh. about waiting twelve thousand years to just do something. I'm so impatient. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so. I guess with <laughs> also another realization that's coming here is, just, you know, well, the cycles of our civil our civilization is is impatient. I mean, that yeah. The, the thing is, is we, we are harmonized with these cycles, and they're in our nervous systems. Yeah. I don't know if you're that. I mean, yes, but if you. If we run that rhythm, we feel impatient because the world is the world rushing is. us up. Yeah, yeah. It's, the civilization is like we have to do something new. No, 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 no. no, no, no. no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> I so I understand that I'm a product of our culture and civilization. Yeah. However, from this other new perspective that's washing over me, and and I mean, it's like everything you, the things that you're bringing, though, Aubrey, are reflections of slowing down. It's true, right? Like it's a reflection of remembering. Yeah, of remembering exactly. Yeah, that that if we want to go faster, we actually have to go slower. And that's why you have to leave the trauma. Yeah, to slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Wow. Mm. Well, this is a <laughs> wild fucking podcast. So let's suffer <laughs> <laughs> and slow down. Mm. <laughs> Anything else uh, either one of you guys want to add before we uh, drift off into our little sleep death <laughs> that awaits us? See you in 12,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see you tomorrow, motherfucker. I'm going to see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not done with you yet, Matias. <laughs> we, got some, we got some more time here. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for tuning into this podcast and uh, and having some fun with us on this journey of remembering. And thank you, Matthias, for offering your wisdom, a very unique set of wisdom. Thank you, John, for really understanding such similar wisdom from your own lens and your own your own way. And in my own way, I've, you know, studied the wisdom in the way that I could. And this is also the beauty of this time is that we're able to, through this external technology communication, actually, and planes and ability to travel, we're able to gather, put microphones in front of us, exchange ideas, communicate, and start to weave uh, a new story of a new human and a new humanity and a new, uh, a new civilization. So thank you to you both. I love you guys. Thank you for giving the space. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.